So here it is. A rock is thrown straight up from the edge of a cliff and it falls into a lake below. The rock moves past you on its way back down six seconds after it has been thrown. H how fast is a rock moving when it hits the lake, which is 28 meters, 28.0 meters below the point where the rock was thrown? So we've all done this. You stand someplace, you throw a rock up, it goes up and then it goes back down. But as it passes you, it actually, or maybe you extend your hand over a cliff, right? Don't, don't get to the edge. You, and you throw it up, it goes above you, stops, and then it comes back down. It comes back to your eye level again or your hand level again, but then it continues past you all the way down 28 meters below you, which is a lake. And the question is, um, how fast is the rock moving when it hits the lake? All I wanna know is how fast it's moving. So in the previous problems, a lot of times we can just do it in one step or maybe two steps. So let's think about what we would do. All right, so let's go to our equations of motion. What we wanna know is how fast it's moving, right? Now you can always use the core equations, but we can see that we cannot get this in one step, right? Because this problem gives me a velocity in terms of its initial velocity uh, and uh, the, the gravity and the time, but we don't know how long this takes. All we're told is that when it goes up and it comes back to our eye level, it, that part takes six seconds but we have no idea how long it takes to race down to the lake. So we actually do not know the complete time that it takes for the journey to happen. So we don't know T, and we also don't know the initial velocity because it never tells me how hard I'm throwing the thing, right? So we really cannot use this equation to find V. Then we look at this equation and we're like, okay, well, we have the distance information. We know where things start and end. But again, I don't know that initial velocity and I don't know that time. So you feel like you're stuck. Now these other equations are eliminating variables here. So let's take a look at the third one. So this is the final velocity. That's what I want in terms of the initial velocity, gravity, and the position information where it starts and where it ends. So I know where it starts and where it ends. I know that, but I don't know that initial velocity. So you start to get discouraged and you, you run into the same problems here. I know the positions, but I don't know that initial velocity. Uh, and I, uh, I know the positions here, and I could solve for the velocity, but I don't know the time uh, that the journey takes. So you get, you start to panic if you're on a test because you start looking at the equations and you don't, you feel like you don't have enough information to solve the problem. So then that's when you take a deep breath and you say, okay, obviously I don't have enough uh, information to use only one equation to solve this problem, but what would I do? This is the equation most, most likely to help me because it's calculating the velocity uh, and it has the position information, which I have. The only thing I'm missing is that initial velocity. I'm standing there, I throw it. I don't know how, hard, how fast I throw it up. So what we're gonna do is break this problem into two parts. The first part is we're going to just throw the, the rock up. It goes up, it comes down back to my hand. And it tells us that that part of the journey does take six seconds. So see, I have the time information for just a part of the journey, up and then back down to my hand level. We're gonna use that just to find the initial velocity I've thrown the, ball, the rock. Once I know the initial velocity, then I can run it back through this thing to figure out the, uh, the final velocity once it goes below my level. So there's two parts. First part, let's just draw a picture of the first part of the motion. All right, just the first part of the motion, right? And you have to do this a lot. You have to break problems up. I mean, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is sometimes. So in this situation, we, uh, or standing at the ledge, we throw it up, it starts to slow down, it reaches the top of its journey, the arrows are getting smaller, and then it accelerates back down, it's picking up speed, arrows are getting longer, and I'm back to where I started. Now we know that this is a cliff, right? There's like a person standing here, you know, and then there's a cliff, and we know that down here is like a lake down here. We know that, but we're not considering that right now. We're only considering the first part of the motion there. And what do we know about this? This journey up and then back down takes a time value of 6.0 seconds, right? That's how long that takes. What else do we know? Now it doesn't tell us what position it starts and what position it ends. All we know is that the lake is 28 meters below my, my hand, right? That's what I know. So you might say, well, what do I put for the positions? Why and why not? Well, you have freedom, okay? So if you define that the initial position, it defined this cliff face. This is a cliff face. You can kind of think of it as a cliff. It kind of goes off like this, right? That's a cliff. 
zero meters. That's my initial position. Then as the rock gets back down to the initial position again, the final position again is at zero meters because I'm back where I started. And then when I do that later, what I'm going to do later in the next step, I'm going to say that this lake has a position of negative 28 meters uh, negative 28 meters. And when I say negative 28 meters, it's going to be relative to what? It's going to be relative to my zero point. So if I'm considering the ground I'm standing on up here, the zero point, the lake is negative 28 meters, meaning 28 meters below my position. That's how I'm going to handle the position of the lake later. But for right now, we're just going to ignore that and say we're, we have only one problem here. The first part, it goes up, it comes down, it takes six seconds, and it starts and lands at the exact same position, which is just zero meters above the ground. So what equation am I going to use? I want to find that initial velocity. I know the positions. I know the time. I'm going to solve for the initial velocity. So I'm going to write down that y minus y naught is equal to v naught t minus 1 half times g times t squared. All right. And then I'm going to uh, uh, write down what I know. I'm going to uh, recognize immediately that these are both 0 because the initial and final are, are both uh, positions of zero. I still want to solve for v naught and I have one half g t squared. So now what do I want to do? I'm going to solve for v naught. So I'm going to move this over here so it's going to be positive one half g t squared when I add this to both sides and that's going to be equal to v naught t. And if I'm solving for that initial velocity, it's going to be this side of the equation, one half g t squared divided by the t. And so I've solved for that initial velocity. Now we see that we have a t squared on the top, so one of them will cancel with the t on the bottom. And so really what we have is that this initial velocity is just one half times gravity times t. One half times g times t. So now we put in the values. We have one half, we have 9.81 meters per second squared, and the time that this journey takes is six seconds. And so the initial velocity, 1 half times 9.81 times 6.0, you get 29.42 meters per second. And notice that the answer we get is positive, and that means that I must be throwing this thing up. That's the only way that it's going to take second, uh, six seconds for it to get back to my starting point if this is an oriented uh, positive velocity up. So now that we know the initial velocity by considering only part of the problem, we're going to go back and we're going to uh, uh, use this equation to help us because now we know the initial velocity oriented up. We know gravity, we know the initial position, and we know the, uh, the initial position, we know the final position landing in the lake. Now we're going to consider the whole motion landing in the lake, and we will find what velocity you get at the end of that whole thing. So what we're going to do is then draw a picture of the new situation. So here we're going to have uh, some person, you know, standing at the edge of a cliff or whatever it is, and there's some upward, uh, uh, motion here. But then there is a new position down here, which is the lake, down below. And what we're basically going to say is that we throw this thing upward with some large velocity and it slows down and slows down and slows down. Then it turns around and accelerates. It gets bigger. It gets bigger. It gets bigger, but then it goes past and it gets even bigger and it gets, you know, and it lands in this lake. Of course, uh, the arrow should be a little bit longer. Maybe I should make this one big giant arrow. It lands in the lake. Now let's write down all the information we know about this problem statement, right? So we know that the initial position, why not, is zero meters. We're going to consider the, the cliff face again to be the initial position. But the final position is now no longer up here. The final position is here, which is at negative 28 meters. That's the position of the lake. When you put a negative sign on a position, it's got to be relative to some reference point, and the reference point is here, and so that's 28 meters down below, right? And the other thing that I know is that the initial velocity is also now known, 29.42 meters per second, 29.42 meters per second oriented up. So I know the initial velocity, I know the initial position, I know the final position. Now I don't know the time. Because all I know is this took six seconds to get here, back to my initial place, but I don't actually know how long this takes. So I do not know the time of the entire travel. But that's okay, because I'm going to use an equation that does not have a time uh, dependency. It's just going to be this. So let's write this equation down. So what it's going to be is uh, v squared is v naught squared minus 2 times g times y minus y naught. All right? So the final velocity, 
uh, well, we're solving for that final velocity, we have to take the square root of both sides. So what we're gonna have is plus minus the square root, because when we do a square root, we have to put a plus or minus, v naught squared minus two times g times y minus y naught. Now I wanna pay careful attention. You get two answers here, and so we have to kind of figure out which one is the correct answer. It's gonna be the same number, but it's gonna be positive or negative. Well, which one do you choose, really, okay? So uh, the, the problem says, if you read it literally, it says how fast is the rock moving when it hits the lake? So that's kind of an indication of speed. They just want a positive number. They want a number. Uh, they don't care about the sign of the number because it's asking for the speed, okay? Um, but I'm gonna show you what the equation is really spitting out once we calculate this. So let's go ahead and keep the plus minus and let's hang on to it till the very end. So we're gonna have plus or minus and we're gonna take the square root of all this stuff where V naught is going to be uh, 29.42, 29.42, that's gonna be squared minus two times 9.81. And then we have y minus y naught. So y is the final position, that's negative 28, and minus the initial position, which is zero, and so all that lives under the radical there. This looks like a six or something, that's a, that's a zero. So what do we have here? We have plus or minus. Under this radical, we're gonna have 800. This, when you square this, 29.42 squared, we get 865.54. And then when we two times 9.8 times negative 28, we get negative 549.36. So we have a minus, but the quantity we get is negative, so it's minus and negative. And all of this stuff lives under a radical. So then we have plus or minus, under here, when you have this minus a negative, it becomes a plus. So when you add it up, it gets 1414.90. And then when you take the square root of this, you get plus or minus, uh, you get plus or minus 37.61 meters per second. Now, what does it mean? When you uh, have an equation with a square quantity, like when we have time, time squared, then oftentimes when you solve for time, you have, well, you have to have two answers. So you get a positive and a negative answer, right? Velocity in this equation was squared because the, the equation related the squares of the velocities. So there's two viable answers that you get out of that or two answers that algebraically you get out of that. Now you have to figure out which one's right. And so how do you do that? Well, we know that the initial velocity was positive. That means it was oriented up. So we know physically that when it comes down and hits the water, the actual velocity is gonna be oriented down. It has to be a negative because it has to be opposite of this. So then we know that the velocity has to be negative 37.61 meters per second. However, the problem didn't ask for the velocity. The problem said, well, how fast is it moving? <laughs> so really the speed if you wanna look at it this way, is when you take that velocity and just strip the sign away, 37.61 meters per second. So circle this, but really I think it's better to put the velocity because it tells you the direction the thing is moving when it hits the lake, which of course is the negative number, 37.61. So this is a good problem because uh, when you first read it, you try to set it up and solve it all in one place, but you don't have enough information to do it. Maybe you see a way that I don't. And if you do, good for you, because I don't, I don't know everything. But when I looked at it, I did not immediately know how to put it together all in one step, right? Because you're starting and you're ending point and not knowing the whole time of flight, it, there's just too many variables missing. So we break it up into two pieces, knowing that, eight, that it takes a certain amount of seconds to come back to where it started, allows us to find the initial velocity up, and then once we have that, then we can put, notice the uh, starting and the ending position, it's perfectly fine to put a, a final position as a negative number. It just means it's landing lower than where, where you start from, right? And so that's, that's the kind of thing. There's many other ways to solve this problem, many other ways. I can just tell you one more right now. If we know that the initial velocity is 29.42 going up, then once it reaches the top and comes back down, then we know that right as it passes me, it must be going negative 29.42 down. So you could split this up into a, a new problem where you said, Okay, forget about the rest of it. Now I started a cliff face and I throw something down at a negative velocity of 29.42 negative down and it travels uh, to a final position, you know, 28 meters below. So I could break it up into a new problem where I give it an initial velocity down and then I calculate, you know, how fast it's traveling when it, when it hits the lake. You're gonna get the same exact answer. But I like this better because some students are afraid to put in negative values for position and, and it's totally allowed. It's totally legal to do that. All right, so solve this one. Solve it a few different ways. When you're comfortable, move on to the next lesson. We have one last problem with free fall acceleration. 
learn anything at mathandscience.com.